Yeah, so today we're going to talk about Java debugging internals, um, which basically means I'm going to, we're going to build a debugger together. We're going to go through the steps, understand how we do it, um, and in the end, we'll have a debugger. So let me start by introducing myself. I'm a software engineer at Rookout. I really love learning programming languages and like jumping between them. So I'm on a team that works in about seven different programming languages. So one day it's Java and one day it's Go, and I really like that. Uh, and when I'm not next to my computer, I'm probably sewing. So that's me. Um, now at Rookout, we're building what we like to call a live debugger or a production grade debugger. Thank you. Which means that, um, and part of that is what I like to call dynamic snapshots. Now, dynamic snapshots are basically these three things. First of all, dynamic snapshots can be added or removed to lines of code dynamically while your code is running. Uh, secondly, they'll capture local variables and stack traces. Now, this does sound pretty similar to breakpoints, uh, and this isn't just randomly called building a Java debugger, because if I switch out snapshots and breakpoints, this is basically what a breakpoint does, right? You can add it or remove it to lines of code dynamically while your code is running. It captures local variables and stack traces. But the thing that we do differently at Rookout is that we do this for production. And that adds a few limitations or a few new criteria for our debugger. So the first thing is that we want minimum performance impact, right? If collecting all your local variables and a stack trace and sending it um, for you to watch will take one second, that's a lot of time. And no one wants to put that kind of latency in their production servers. So that's the first criteria. The second is that we want to debug more than one instance at a time, right? How often do you have just one instance of your production app running? You probably have more than that. And you might not know wh where the request you want to debug is currently, which pod is currently taking care of it, right? So you might want to put a breakpoint on all of your pods just to find the right one. So we'll need to debug more than one instance at a time. And the last thing is that multiple people might want to debug the same thing at the same time. So this doesn't happen when you're debugging locally, right? You never like, tell a friend, oh, I'm going to share my debugging session with you. Go ahead and place breakpoints. I, I don't really know any tools that can do that. That's not really that popular. Usually, you'll maybe share the screen. You'll maybe sit on the same computer. But it's not that popular that you'll have two separate debugging sessions for the same app. But in production, that's probably what's going to happen, right? You might have two teams that integrate with the same product, and they both want to uh, debug that product. So they're gonna, you're going to have multiple people debugging the same instance at once. So these are all kind of things to think about. But I really did like the basis that we're doing breakpoints. And so we're not the first people who ever thought to place a breakpoint on a Java application. And so I started by looking at the existing debuggers for Java. And the first one, or the most prominent one, is JDB, which is a CLI debugger. You've probably used it, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Um, and JDB, it works. It's pretty simple. You'll have one app, which is the debuggy, right, the app that you're debugging, and then one side, which is the debugger. And so you're going to run the debuggy. It's going to be, you're going to attach to it an agent lib with the agent lib flag right there. And then once you run the debugger, it'll attach, and your debugger will basically control everything in your app using the JVM. Um, so that's pretty neat, and we wanted to find out how that works. Um, so Oracle documentation has a lot about this, and it uses something called the Java Platform Debugging Architecture. Um, now, as you can see here, it consists of three interfaces designed for use by debuggers in development environments or desktop systems. And while it is for, for debuggers, it doesn't have to be only for debuggers. And the tools that we're going to talk about, they can be used for so much more. Uh, and I really think like, that's the reason I wanted to, give, to, to bring this story to you, not because I think everyone should go and build their own debugger, but because once you know these set of tools, you can basically do anything you want to your JDM, JVM or in your JVM. So let's kind of look at these three interfaces. So each interface is another level of abstraction. So I'll start with the highest level of abstraction, which is Java Debug Interface. And then under that, we have Java Debug Wire Protocol. And under that, we have Java Virtual Machi Machine Tool Interface. And I'm going to call them just by JDI, JDWP, and JVMTI, uh, because it's kind of difficult to say their names. 
But what you need to know is that each one is built on top of the other. So JV JDI uses JDWP, which uses JVMTI. And so because JDI is the most high-level one, it's the one we wanted to start with. It's a high-level Java API. So when to use this API, you just need to code in Java, which is good for all of us, I think. Uh, it allows you to inspect what's going on in your program, right? look at things, just observe, and also control. Stop at certain lines, step into functions, step out of functions, maybe, be, maybe even change a variable value or two. And it allows you to connect remotely, which is exactly what we saw JD, the Java debugger do. Right? We saw it connect remotely to a different app. Now, I kind of wanted to show you a really, really simple debugger flow. Because JDI really is incredible. It allows you to do so much in so few lines of code. Um, so basically, to create like, the simplest debugger ever, all you're going to have to do is launch and connect. Um, so once you just launch the app that you want to debug, it'll, it'll return a virtual machine instance to you. And how you interact with that virtual machine instance is through requests and events. So you'll request to sign up for a certain event. Uh, for instance, a breakpoint or a watchpoint or a thread stop, thread start. There are tons of events. Um, so you request one. And then the virtual machine just has a queue of these events. And so you can pull from that queue and kind of see which events are going on. And for each event you sign up to, once you pull it, you have to resume the VM, because it's the virtual machine, because it'll stop until you resume it. So basically, you have full control of everything happening in the app that you launched. So once we've understood that, what we're going to do is launch the app. We're going to request to be notified when a class is prepared. Um, in Java, classes aren't loaded, are loaded on demand, so they aren't loaded just when you start up your JVM, but only when you actually use them. And so you're going to say, when this class is ready to be used, notify me. And so when the class is ready to be used and we've been notified, we're going to add a breakpoint on that class. And add a breakpoint, again, it's going to be a request. So you're going to say, please notify me when this breakpoint event happens. And once that breakpoint event happens, the breakpoint is hit then we are able to print all the variables. So let me show that to you in code. It really is not a lot of code. My point is not to like, teach you this syntax of uh, JDI, because you can Google it, and it's pretty simple. Can you see that? No, it's really small, huh? Um, just a second. My point is not going to be to show you exactly how to, um, how to use the uh, JDI in order to perfectly go home and use it, but to kind of show you overall how easy it is to create a debugger with just a few simple lines of code. And let me increase font size. There we go. Just a second. We're working on it. Any questions so far? OK, let's see if this is good enough. Can you see that? Oh, just a second. Is that visible? Is this good? Yes, no? Someone from the back? No, OK, one more. That good? <laughs> OK. OK. So let's go over this really quickly. Um, basically, we have, first of all, our debugger program right here, the program that we're debugging. Uh, very, very simple. Um, just a greeting. We're going to print it. We want two variables just to see that we can collect variables and all that. Uh, what we do want to do is place a breakpoint on line 9. And since I really wanted to keep, th keep this code simple in my debugger, I just specified exactly which line I want to put the breakpoint on and which class to put it on. So in a normal debugger, you'd get this from the user, but I did this ahead of time. Now, as I said, the first, th first thing we need to do is to create our virtual machine to launch the program that we're debugging. So for that, we're going to use this method, connect and launch VM. And basically, we just do all this virtual machine things. And then we say we want the main, func m the main class to be called uh, to be our debug class. Pretty simple. This method will just 
launch our, uh, our app, and it'll be running. Now, the next thing we want to do is to be notified to prepare the class and to be notified when it's finished preparing. And so we're going to enable a class prepare request. So that's over here. So we'll just request from the event request manager the class prepare request. And we're going to enable that. We're going to filter only on the specific class we want to debug. Otherwise, we wouldn't be notified on every single class, and we don't want to do that. Um, so we can simplify that. And once we've done that, we can, whenever the class is prepared, we'll want to sign up for a breakpoint event. So we'll set breakpoint, which is over here, which will, once again, we'll use a breakpoint request. We'll create the request, and then we'll enable it on the specific line that we want. And so once we've enabled that breakpoint, the next event we're going to get is a breakpoint event, right? So once we get that event, we are able to just pull all the variables. We have a, from the event, we'll just get all the frames of where we are right now, so all the stack frames. And each stack frame, we're going to have the local variables. And basically what happens here is in those three functions, uh, we've created a debugger. So We've told we've a class has been prepared. We've set a breakpoint, and we're printing the variables, which is very very cool. Um, so, I really I really enjoy this interface. I think it's really good. But we did say that we don't just want any breakpoint. We want a production grade breakpoint, right? And when using JDI, we're going to have no availability during collection. So what that means is that when I'm at a breakpoint, I'm not only stopping the specific thread that the breakpoint is currently using. I'm stopping the whole process. And that can be very problematic, right? Because if one user sends in a request and I want to debug that request, there's no, no reason that another user who sent in another request will experience any performance impact because I'm debugging something else, right? That's not something that we want. So it may be something that we're OK with, but it is not ideal. Next, we have zero control or visibility. The code is super simple, super abstract, which is nice to write. But then if there are certain things that we want to happen in a slightly different way, we're not going to be able to do that because the code, we don't know how things work, and we can't control them from the inside. It's also easy to make mistakes. So we're debugging production, right? Now, your debugger is here, and the code that you're debugging is here. And what happens if there's a disconnection while you're debugging? Is this is your production app just stopped forever? Will it wait for another debugger to connect? We don't even know, and it's it's going to be so easy for this mistake to happen and just get a lot of performance impact, or maybe even the cr Apple crash, and we really don't want that. And this only allows for single instance debugging, so I'm going to have to create a VM for every single app that I want to run. Right? We have multiple pods. I'm going to have to create a virtual virtual machine for each one. It's possible, but it's kind of difficult and to manage all of them. So I took it a step down and into JDWP. Now, JDWP, as it sounds, it's just a protocol. So JDI just implements this protocol in Java and uses it. Um, this protocol is used for communication between the debugger and the JVM, which it debugs. So basically, the JVM implements one side of the protocol, our debugger implements the other side, and whenever the JVM receives a request in this protocol, it's just going to control the app, depending on what we sent it. Um, so that's pretty cool, but it's already been implemented in Java using JDI, and I don't think implementing it again in Java is going to give me much, um, much advantage. It's not really going to help me in any way. And like, basically what I'm saying is that it has the same downsides as using JDI, because we still don't have visibility. We just still don't have control. It's still we don't know what happens when we're disconnected. This is still for single instance debugging. But on top of that, I'm going to have to learn the protocol and to manage multiple clients and servers in this protocol. So I think it's better to use JDI than JDWP directly. But then I went even lower to JVMTI. And JVMTI is a native programming interface. So now we're not going to be coding in Java. We're going to be coding in native code. It interacts directly with the JVM. So right before we, it was JDI requesting things from the JVM, well, JVMTI will be telling the JVM directly. 
And once again, it allows us to inspect and control the app. So because these are different layers of abstraction and they're all one on top of the other, then everything you can do with JDI, you can do with JVMTI. It's probably just going to be a little bit more difficult. You may be asking yourself, how much more difficult? So this is the code to get a stack trace in JVMTI, and I'll save you the trouble of reading that. It's a lot of code. Now, this isn't such a problem, but the same exact thing in plain Java would be this one line. So you can use JVMTI, but it is going to be incredibly complex. Um, not only because you're writing not in Java or in C or in C++, but also because the API itself is more complex. It doesn't have the levels of, of abstraction that JDI has. You're also exposed to native vulnerabilities because you're writing in C or C++. It's not portable. You might have to write different versions depending on your operating system or your architecture. Um, and bugs are catastrophic. Bugs are always bad, but when you control the JVM, bugs are really bad. So you can use JVMTI. I think this is really an incredible interface, but it's going to be complicated. And so basically, if this was all I had, I would definitely use JVMTI. But I was kind of like, maybe somewhere out there, there's something that's newer, it's more simple. It allows us full control. Not only please place a breakpoint or please stop at this line, but also this is what we do on this line and stop only this thread or stuff like that. It'll be in the process itself. So I'm not you know, connecting remotely, <coughs> but I'm actually debugging from inside the process. I'm placing the breakpoint from inside the process. And it is virtually unbreakable because the JVM is it's, it's a safety net, right? You write code and you're like, well, maybe I'll get an exception, but I won't get like a segmentation fault, right? My code won't crash completely. Um, and so I want to use the JVM. I want that capability. I want to write safe Java code. So maybe there is something. And of course, there is. Uh, so fortunately for us, Java 6 introduced Java agents, um, which basically mean we don't have to use JVMTI to do the same thing. Um, OK, so Java agents do use the JVI, JVMTI interface, um, or yes, interface behind the scenes, but they wrap it in a Java-ling instrument API. Um, and what's going to happen is you'll have a jar of your Java agent. So you write a Java agent, create a jar from it, and you'll have your app. And when you run your app, you could just say, please attach this Java agent to my app. And as you can see, they're both running on the same JVM. They're both protected by the JVM. Um, and so this will allow us to do things that we, couldn't, we just couldn't have done before. Just a second. Um, so yeah. So I want to show you a quick example. Let's say we have this sample program. Very, very simple. We have this uh, loop of just printing hello world. And so when we compile it, right, we can um, create a run the jar. Um, and we'll just get hello world in a loop, right? So what can I do with a Java agent that would change that? Well, the first thing you need to know about Java agents is the pre-main function. Whereas usually Java programs start at the main function, Java agents start at the pre-main function. So as you can probably tell, it means that they run before the main function. Um, there is also an agent main function. If you want to j run your Java agent in a different way, uh, you can look that up. It's not really the point uh, right now. So we're going to discuss pre-main. Um, so this is just going to run before anything else runs, before the main function runs. Now, another thing about the pre-main function is that you're going to get an instrumentation instance. And this instrumentation instance is the way you're going to use the instrumentation API, which will allow you to do really cool things. Just so you know, Java agents are used in most profilers and coverage analy anal analyzers. Um, static, like, this is a very widely used API, and it can be used for so many different things. So once we get that instrumentation, we can use it in order to instrument our code, and we're going to see how shortly. But just for a very, very simple example, we're just going to print hello Java Summit. And kind of let's see how we run that. So all we have to do is to build our Java agent into a jar. 
and then run our hello world jar with our new Java agent. So we didn't need to build the hello world jar differently. We need to, didn't need to do anything. We just need to add that uh, command line argument. And once that happens, we do see that our pre-main function ran before hello world's main function. Uh, so this is pretty cool, but not really. It might be useful, but it doesn't really show the full power of Java agents. So before I really dive into how we use Java agents, let's talk about the JVM itself. Um, well, the JVM itself, right, it takes code, it compiles it, it gets Java bytecode, and then it uses that Java bytecode and runs it, ex executes it. Um, now, this doesn't really matter which language atop the JVM you're writing in, right? Scala will just use a different compiler, but the end result will still be Java bytecode. Closure, Kotlin, still the same. Now, what happens when we reach a certain class for the first time? For instance, on line 33, we created a new item, and this is the first time in our code that we've used the item class. Well, the JVM does not know this bytecode. It only loads the bytecode once the class is going to be used. So what it does is it's going to request the item class bytecode from something called a class loader. A class loader, exactly as it sounds, loads classes. So the JVM requests the bytecode of a certain class, and the class loader will return that bytecode. Pretty stra straightforward. So J JVM will request that from the class loader, and the class loader will return the bytecode to the JVM. And then the JVM is just going to use this bytecode for every single time in the future. It's not going to request the bytecode again. Um, but this is pretty much everything about class loaders. Now, what we can do with our instrumentation API is use a class file transformer. So when we use a class file transformer, we're going to create something like this. When the JVM goes and requests the item class bytecode, it's going to go to the class loader. And the class loader is going to return the item class bytecode. But before the JVM uses it, it's going to call our class file transformer. And the class file transformer can be anything. But what it does, it receives the item class bytecode and it outputs a new item class bytecode. So we could change it entirely, just give it entirely different um, bytecode. It can change only certain things. But the JVM, what the JVM knows is only the bytecode that's returned from our class file transformer. So basically, what this means is that we can control anything, any class, in any way we want to, as long as we're running as Java agents. So what we want to do is create a class file transformer that will add our snapshot, right? We'll create a class file transformer that will check for a certain line and add a snapshot in the bytecode when we want. Um, so in order to add a class file transformer, we're going to use the instrumentation API and the function add transformer. Pretty simple. In order to create a class file transformer, we just need to implement the class file transformer interface and uh, override the transform method. And the transform method does exactly, I'm guessing, what you would expect. It receives the class file, the class bytecode that the class loader returned, and it outputs the new class bytecode. Um, now, at this point, that's pretty nice. Like, we get the bytecode, and then we return new bytecode. We have a ton of control, but I'm not sure about any of you, but I don't know how to read bytecode. Like, a, an array of bytes that represents Java bytecode. I don't know it personally. Um, good for me. There are open source bytecode manipulation tools, and there are a lot of them. Uh, just a few examples, ASM, Java, Syst, ByteBuddy, BCEL, and ByteMen. Uh, I really like ASM just because it really gives them give me control over specific things. Um, it's really fine-tuned, but Java Assist, for example, is going to be more high-level, so it's going to be easier to use, but less control. Um, and basically, what ASM allows me to do is for every single instruction, for every single Java bytecode instruction, it's going to give me a node that represents that instruction. So I'm not dealing with bytes anymore. I'm dealing with objects. And I know how to deal with objects. So for every method or for every class, I'm just going to get a list of instructions that represents that class. Um, 
things we might see are, for example, a jump node, which will represent a jump, um, a variable node, which will might might represent a load to a variable or a new variable represent or a new variable declaration. So I'll get all of that. Now I don't want to show you the ASM code because it's kind of difficult, but it will be pretty simple to use ASM in order to add a call to system out println um, with transform. So what we want to do is our transform function is just going to take the bytecode, add a transform uh, call to print, and then keep all the rest of the bytecode the same, and then return it. Um, and then in our transformer, we're just going to filter over the class name that we want, in this case, hello world, and then just add a print call to that specific class. Make sure to filter out the classes you want. Otherwise, you're going to be doing this to JVM classes or standard library classes, and you don't want to do that. Um, then we'll return the new, uh, in any case, we're going to return the original bytecode so we don't change any other class. Now we're going to add that transformer, create a debug transformer, and add it uh, using the instrumentation API. And if we put that all together, then once again, just running our Java agent, no recompiling our uh, hello world jar, then we'll get transformed. So that's pretty cool. Um, it is pretty similar to what the output looks similar to what we did before. But the difference is that before, we were printing from our pre-main function. And now this is what hello world is printing. So hello world is printing transformed, and then it's going into that while true loop of printing hello world. So basically, we just changed the hello world class. Um, so that's nice. But what we wanted is dynamic snapshots. So let's dive in and how we do that. First of all, the method. What we're going to try to do is to inject a hook that will execute a specific function. In this case, we'll call the function breakpoint. Um, on the line of a snapshot. So for instance, if we want a snapshot on line 12, then between after the print call and before the return, we're going to insert a call to our breakpoint function. Now, that sounds simple, but there's something that was kind of worrying me, and that's the JVM execution engine. Um, I really hope none of you are ever worried about the JVM execution engine. It's not fun. But basically, the JVM execution engine is how your bytecode is executed. So it's made up of an interpreter and two compilers. And what happens is the first time that your class is loaded and it's run, you have the bytecode, right? So the JVM takes that bytecode and passes it through an interpreter. Now that um, interpreter will just execute each instruction on itself. Um, there will be no optimizations. It's pretty, it'll be slow, but there's no overhead, right? You didn't need to prepare anything ahead of time. You just can run it as is. And the JVM does some sort of profiling on the code that it interprets. And if a certain piece of code is called enough times or run enough times, it'll be passed on to the C1 compiler. And the C1 compiler optimizes that code. So it does have some overhead, um, but your code will execute more efficiently. Once it has optimized that code, it'll be put in the code cache. Now, there's another profiler on that, on the C1 compiler. And that profiler, if it really re re recognizes a piece of code that is being used a lot, it will pass it on to the C2 compiler. And the C2 compiler is very similar to the C1 compiler, except that it's much more aggressive. The, there will be much more, many more optimizations. Um, it's going to take more time to do, but the end result is going to be more efficient. Um, now, once again, the compiled code will be saved in the code cache. Now. Um, Code that's saved in the code cache isn't there forever. It usually gets, uh, becomes invalid for certain reasons. For instance, if something is optimized out and then it's needed at some point um, or other things, it can go through deoptimization and return back to the interpreter. So while your JVM is running, you'll probably have this whole loop running a few times um, for very popular pieces of code. Now, why does this worry me? Well, this worry me, worries me because that means that sometimes I might not be able to capture all my local variables, right? If they're optimized out, I can't, I, I don't know what they are. I just can't have them. Um, and I really, really want all the local variables, so I want to somehow um, avoid optimizations of local variables. 
So the easiest way, I think, that we found to do this was to just pass those local variables to the function that we're inserting, right? Because if we're inserting a function call and we request all the local variables, right, we pass them on to that function call, then the, the JVM can't optimize them out. They have to pass them on to us, and then we get all the local variables. So that's our solution to that problem. Um, so this is going to be our method, right? We're just going to inject that uh, function call, and let's see how we do that. Um, first of all, the method itself is going to be pretty simple. Um, breakpoint, it'll just get the locals as an object array and print them in a loop. And so we're going to create an add breakpoint, like our add print uh, function before. We're going to create an add breakpoint function, which will accept the, the bytecode of the class. And on a certain line, it's going to add a breakpoint. Now, first of all, we need to find where to insert the breakpoint call. Um, and that's not that simple, because one line of code can be translated to many, many instructions. And so it's just not straightforward to go to a certain line of code. Luckily for us, ASM does this. So ASM will just um, will create these nodes that don't really exist as bytecodes, but the, it will create these nodes that represent this line starts here, and this line starts here. So we'll know where to insert our breakpoint call using ASM. Then we'll push all local variables onto stack. Again, ASM is our savior here. Uh, it comes and it can tell us all the local variables and arguments on a certain line. So we'll know what the local variable names are, where they are, how to collect them, and we'll uh, put them in an array. Next, we're just going insert to insert a call to breakpoint. If you didn't know, in Java, variables are passed on the stack. So we can just push the variables onto the stack and then call the breakpoint, and the variables will pass as the first, instruct first parameter. And then we'll just return the transformed bytecode with all of this. Um, now, once again, this is our uh, main program. We're going to want to place a breakpoint on line four. And so we're just going to change our add print uh, function call to add breakpoint. And this is what's going to happen. Once again, we run with our Java agent. And every single time hello world is printed, we're going to get a breakpoint hit message and the print of all the local variables. In this case, we only had one local variable, right? Uh, we only had our args. Uh, this is probably not the best way to print them. Um, so we can find a better way. But we did successfully create some sort of, of debugger, which is awesome. Now, you might be asking yourself, what if the class has already been loaded? Because up until now, we were kind of assuming that we would know where to place the breakpoint once the program starts, right? We were like, OK, when the program starts, this class is not going to be loaded yet. And then once it's loaded, we'll place the breakpoint, and that's it. But what if we want to remove a breakpoint, or what if the class has already been loaded, and then we want to add a breakpoint. Well, the Java developers thought of everything, and there are two methods we can use in the instrumentation API. One is redefine classes, and the other is retransform classes. Um, they both do very similar things. They have uh, minute details, but basically they allow us to force the JVM to, once again, get the bytecode from the class loader, pass it to our retransform um, or class file retransformer, and then we can add and remove breakpoints whenever we want. So that's pretty cool. So once I put it all together, I can transform on demand, right? I can tell when I want the JVM, when I want a class to be loaded. I can add a call to a breakpoint function or move a call to a breakpoint function if it was already there. And I can access all locals as objects. So putting that all together, um, in our debugger, it looks something like this, where you can see all the variables. Uh, we can collect the stack trace. We can collect everything, which is pretty cool. So thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah. I did want to say that there are so many cool uses for this. And just the other day, um, my friend here was telling me that they use Java agents to uh, dynamically reload classes. So if you change a class while like 
run your Java program and then change it and then save, you can reload it. It, it can be automatically reloaded without having to start the whole JVM or build it uh, from the start. So Java agents are really cool, and they have tons of uses. Um, and I recommend you check them out. And if anyone has questions, 